Oh yeah, we are remodeling this mid-century home. Come on in, boys and girls. So as some of you may or may not know, this is the home that me and my wife purchased a few years ago. Um, we lived in it for two years and every damn day we did DIY on this house. We actually purchased it from the original owners who had this house built in the late 50s. Well, surviving owner, her husband had passed away, unfortunately. But regardless, truly amazing. It was basically a time capsule from the 50s and the 60s. I mean, sure, there was some evidence of remodeling, but I mean, look at that wallpaper. Look at this oven. This oven is definitely original. This house was our first home and we purchased it for around $250,000, figuring that, you know, hey, we're a couple of millennials, we don't have millions of dollars, and so all we can really afford are quote-unquote fixer-uppers. Now, classically speaking, I wouldn't call this exactly a fixer-upper. Like, yes, it's completely and utterly dated, but the thing is, it's also in outstanding condition a time capsule, truly, because we looked at the condition of some of this stuff and we were just amazed, you know? It truly felt like we were fortunate in that regard and flexed on all the other millennials who had not become homeowners at that point. But you can certainly see, like, yeah, classic mid-century, maybe 70s, 80s blunders. You got carpet over hardwood floors, disgusting linoleum, wallpaper everywhere. Here's a snap of the hall. There's the quintessential pink bathroom. I would say this is probably the best preserved room in the entire house. Quite possibly original wallpaper, definitely original tiles. I mean, that shower contraption, probably an 80s thing, but still. Here's the laundry room, and look at that built-in ironing board. Wonderful. They don't, they don't do stuff like this anymore. And there's so many features I appreciated about this house. Leading down further into the hallway, here's the master bedroom, carpets, glorious, glorious red carpet. Um, here is actually a built-in cedar chest. Love this feature. Adjacent to that, another bedroom with this really irritating Tutti Frutti wallpaper. If you stare at it long enough, the 3D image of Eisenhower appears. Through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a... Magic Eye wallpaper. It's amazing in many senses because here is a home that was regarded as quote-unquote, the affordable option in mid-century times. And here we are, 60 years later, clamoring for what you could consider scraps. Anyways, this is the backyard, totally overgrown, nature trying to reclaim the house. And you wouldn't know it, but this is like supposed to be almost a half acre, 0.4 acres of property, but totally overgrown. The front yard, not so bad, but you do have like this uh, <laughs> lamp that's been surrounded by a bush trimmed one too many times. But there it is. Perfect mid-century home in perfect condition. And now we get to remodel it, make it modern. The first thing we did was we got rid of the Gunga-filled carpets. Don't have too many photos. In fact, this is the only one. But you can see the tack strips here. Basically, all you do is you rip up the carpet using like a box cutter knife or something. Just be careful not to damage the floor underneath, and then you pry up the tack strips using a crowbar. But I wish we had done that after the wallpaper, because if we did, it could have served as a tarp. Anyways, as you know, every single wall in this house had wallpaper on it. Every single one. Any wallpaper removal project starts with this wallpaper perforator that you can probably get for like 10 bucks. Then that's followed up with uh, water and vinegar solution, and that seeps into the holes you just created, breaking the glue bonds. And if they were coated in vinyl, they'll come off in clean sheets, but they'll have a paper backing that's left behind, hence the spray bottle. But anyways, you'll be doing a whole lot of this. A ton of scraping, and a whole lot of joint compound troweling over any damage you may have caused by scraping. 
then here is the number one reason why you would want to have a tarp while you do all this because all of this wallpaper, the glue will stick to the floor. <laughs> but here in this hallway, we activated big brain time. Then once the walls were sanded and troweled, we painted them. We painted every room that we could. So remember how I said I had wished how we would have used a tarp? Man, conjugation is hard. How I wish we had used a tarp. Yeah, there we go. You see all that <laughs> residue on the floor? That kept gumming up the discs, the sanding discs in my floor sander. I must have gone through like 10 or 12 of these and at 8 bucks a pop, that ain't exactly cheap. But here's a saving grace for my intelligence. The fact is that the carpet had been there for so long that it left behind glue residues anyway, so Gunga in my sander was my destiny, I guess. <laughs> this wound up being the end result of the sanding, which some might say is a bit uneven, but I say, ah oh, nah man, that's rustic, it's a feature now. Next came staining, which we just applied with some towels and rubbed it into the floor, and then came the seal, the poly coat, the finish for which we chose satin. Looked pretty good, actually. Not a bad result for a first time. After this, we moved in and then started working on the house while living in it. So next up was this puke yellow linoleum, which was glued very well to some plywood, so we just chose to get rid of the plywood as it was there to level the linoleum. Back there, if you have a keen eye, I actually removed the radiator as well. The side paneling was too French, and so we got rid of it in favor of some wainscoting later. A few interesting things of note in this room here. So I had to remove the radiator to do the flooring, but it was also removed and then moved to another wall, to the adjacent wall, in anticipation of using that window to create a sliding glass door into the backyard. With a deck and all that fancy stuff. As is tradition, we left some messages in the underlayment for the next owners to find, uh, but this was generally being accomplished with a pneumatic nailer. Anywhere where I got close to the wall, I used a hammer like this. Nailing on the beat. <laughs> Nailing on the beat. <laughs> Nailing on the beat. <laughs> this particular project probably took about three days. Again, this was me doing it for the first time, making fancy cuts, and there's the moved radiator. I guess somewhere along the line I also switched out the light fixture. And speaking of electrical, let's talk about the outlets. This being a time capsule in the truest sense meant all the outlets, or like 95% of them, were all two-prong, so I had to convert them to three-prong outlets, and there's a couple of ways to do that. I lucked out because it had armored cabling, which, to the best of my knowledge, you can use as a grounding conductor, so long as you make a little pigtail to the metallic junction box, or the outlet box. If you don't have that, then you can just replace all of them with a GFCI, not connect a ground and just slap a sticker on it that says no equipment ground. It's the rules say you can do that. That's what they say. Don't ask me. I find it a bit weird too. And now that we've spent quite a bit of time indoors, why don't we go outside, get some fresh air. Let's see how we did the yard. Now, as a rule of thumb, the older you get, the less your supply of fucks becomes and therefore you just don't have the energy anymore to keep taking care of a yard. I assume that's what happened and that's why it became overgrown. So the first thing we did was we basically tried to clear cut everything in the backyard to at least open up some space and also with the idea being that eventually we want to put a deck there. As for this lamp, I don't know why they did this. They always planted bushes around lamps back in the 60s. Seems to be quite common, so <laughs> what happens when you keep trimming a bush over and over again, eventually it just grows into itself and just becomes this strained ball of stress. And eventually it just becomes unmanageable. Then when I cleared it, I tried to turn it on and I couldn't. So I, I knew it was an electrical issue. So I started digging, looking for the issue and eventually I found it. Turns out that at some point someone was digging carelessly cleave the cable in two and they just kind of taped it in the soil so there's no wonder that it stopped working so i had to redo this whole thing 
And like I said, I dug the trench, found the cable, and I just, I put new cabling in, and I had to feed it through the basement, which also meant that I had to drill a new hole through the entirety of the foundation. <laughs> a lot of fun just to get a lamp to work, but I was determined. <laughs> Part of the yard work involved pulling eponymus bushes, and if you know anything about eponymus, it's kind of an invasive species, it grows like a weed, and just takes over the whole yard, so it had to go. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> so sometimes redneck method is the best method. Here's just a photo, you can see kind of the end result of my lamp work. And here is also part of the problem in the yard. Anytime you put stones into soil, they will sink. So my wife was redoing this while we were doing the yard, kind of going from less cutesy to more functional, but yet reusing those very same stones. Once we ran out, we used some concrete stones we got from the store. Now a bit about this. Um, Bit of a permaculture here. The hump you see in the back is actually called a hügel kultur. So basically a mound. The idea is that as the sticks and plant matter in the mound break down, anything that you plant on top will continue receiving nutrients in perpetuity and therefore the word permaculture. So nice nifty little experiment that we did. My wife also constructed this herb spiral out of old bricks in the back patio. The concept here is that the spiral will slow down the natural flow of water, but also create microclimates for each herb as it needs it. So an interesting idea here, and here we created more of kind of a landscaping and a general idea. And finally, I'd be remiss in not discussing the wildflower incident. So, in our eternal conquest to try to defeat the boomers to never have to mow a lawn again, because the lawns are just so annoying, so finicky, um, we planted in the place of grass wildflowers, which for a time actually yielded outstanding results. Really quite beautiful. As you can see, it, it grew in in a matter of months, and during the summer, it was just wonderful. You could look out into the front yard and be greeted by fields of flowers that you theoretically didn't have to mow. And the herb spoiler here was surrounded by vegetables and all kinds of food that we planted in the soil. Eventually, though, I think due to there being so much nutrition in the soil, it just got out of control. Weeds got mixed in with the wildflowers, <laughs> and later in the season, when the, once the sunflowers died, it you had scenes like these with squirrels just doing strange acrobatics, collecting the seeds. Not really that big of a problem. The bigger problem was the fact that the wildflowers there in the back had grown to be like three feet tall. Though the neighbors didn't say anything, I'm sure they did not like that one bit. We had no choice but to let it all die out over the winter, and then we just mowed it all down. <laughs> so that was the wildflower experiment. We theorized that the situation got out of hand so fast was because we aerated the soil and there was just way too much nutrition for things to just go wild there in the backyard. And in the end, we wound up becoming the very thing which we sought to destroy. Lawn mowing boomers. Then it was time to build a deck and a sliding glass door to the backyard. In terms of sheer impact, I would say this is perhaps one of the most important things that we did to the house because of what it wound up adding. Which, the deck in and of itself, nothing too special, but it did the job. Basically something that just floated on top of the soil. Now, as for the sliding glass door, here's where having moved the radiator came in handy. Definitely an awkward time, because you basically punch a massive hole in the wall, and you better be damn sure that you have ample time to finish the whole project in a day. Which, fortunately, we did. We managed to pull it off, 
and created a wonderful sliding glass door leading into the backyard. It really opened up and brightened up the space and provided much needed utility uh, and access point into the backyard. And now let's talk about ceiling fans. At some point we actually decided to move out of this house and while we were waiting for me to get a new job, I started getting bored, ants in my pants, and we started thinking about th not things we would like in the house, but things we assume the next tenants might appreciate. So there I go installing shit again, and in this case, a ceiling fan. And after doing this project and becoming a, an attic goblin, routing electrical wires and cables through the walls and the attic, it's just, I gain a whole new appreciation for things having already been done. This one was surprisingly tough, tougher than I thought it would be between what I just described and later attempting to balance the fan blades because the thing kept wobbling, but absolutely worth it. Love the result and because we're in New England, don't really need air conditioning, but fans are appreciated. And in the end, I managed to make it windy inside. Now let's go to the bathroom. This was the single most challenging project in this entire house. And now all the reasons why this was challenging, the reason it was challenging the most was because this was the bathroom we had to continue to use on a daily basis because it's the only bathroom in the house. So you're trying to destroy and preserve the bathroom at the same time while taking a shit in it and while showering in it. That's why it was so damn hard and took us about 10 days of rigmarole mixed with construction. And so for the first round of malarkey, the toilet. Holy Jesus. What is that? What the fuck is that? Yeah, once I removed the toilet, I knew I was in a world of shit, so to speak. Because back in the day, they used to use cast iron uh, toilet flanges, which over the course of time, just rot away. So as soon as I removed the toilet, it became useless. That cast iron flange held together just by hopes and dreams at that point, and mostly just rust, fell apart. So in typical fashion, something that I thought would take a couple of hours took me all day, like 14 hours straight. Here, I wanted to update the handles a little bit, but turns out I had to replace the whole mix valve for that to become a reality because the hardware could never match. Then I painted the tub with what I still call Satan's piss because this stuff stinks and burns your eyes. We destroyed the vanity, built up a new one. I did one of my most proud plumbing jobs I have ever done. I, I just love the way this turned out. Played Legos with the drain pipes. Again, this, this part was definitely fun. This part, eh, not as much fun. Using a, an air hammer to get rid of the tiles that we didn't like and becoming an absolute wizard at using an angle grinder. Because we were trying to do the tile job in one go, it took us until about 5 in the morning to lay the last tile. At some point, I also decided to replace the bathroom fan, which... As it turns out, I discovered did not vent outside, but it vented into the attic, so I had to create all new piping to lead outside. Which, in retrospect, I'm not sure if that was necessary, considering it was fine for 60 years, but I'm, I w I'm just a stickler for following the rules, I guess. And here I learned a lesson about how good the old style fan actually was. The bathroom never ever fogged up when we used that fan. And so I had gone through literally three other ceiling fans or bathroom fans before I found one that was as effective as the old one. And the one I picked was 200 CFM. I don't know how people can live with foggy bathrooms, especially with what tends to happen is you get these shitsicles starting to hang from your ceiling. I I'm not joking. I have this theory. When your bathroom is humid and you take a steamy dump, I think that poop particulates actually condensate on the ceiling, and that is why eventually you start seeing these brown spots hanging off the ceiling. <laughs> I think those are actual shitsicles. But the rest of the bathroom wasn't too bad. A bit of electrical, new light fixtures, 
as a tradition, anything I uncover with old construction, I find like disaster. So I found a piddly junction box that was nowhere near rated to carry the weight of an entire light, light fixture. So I had to put my own one in and affix it to an actual joist. But when it was all said and done, absolutely worth it. This looked like the straight up Taj Mahal once we were through with it. Maybe not to everyone's taste, but certainly to our taste. I love this bathroom. It brightened it up. It was clean. It was white. It was modern. I just felt clean just being in it. Love this project, or at least the outcome of this project. After depinkifying the bathroom, we moved to the kitchen for one of our final projects. It started with the wall oven, which wasn't too bad of a project, just involved cutting a larger hole. And if anyone is wondering, I actually did wind up selling the old oven. Somebody wanted it, which I'm glad for because I didn't want to destroy a perfectly functional wall oven, particularly one that may have historical significance to someone. The next thing we did was we removed all the cabinet doors, sanded them, repainted them white, and also we switched out all the hardware on them for maximum impact. This probably took three or four days as they required multiple coats because some of the old dirt kept seeping through the paint. And I'm wondering if we should have used some kind of sealing primer before painting them white. But all in all, not too bad a project. Then I decided to tackle the replacement of the cooktop, which probably most certainly wasn't original. Maybe it was from the 80s or 90s. This was a pretty decent project too. Um, just had to customize the opening to fit the new one. And the new one I got an excellent deal on from a Sears store closing sale. So a thousand dollar cooktop for about 300 bucks. Not too bad. Rest in peace to Sears, I guess. Replacing the range hood vent, the original new tone, is a project I have not very good feelings about. Mostly because the range hood showed me just how wrong I was for replacing it. Ah, uh, shit! Yep, despite my best efforts. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. The universe has a funny way of showing you the errors of your ways. <laughs> but I suppose the bright side to this is that I also sold this range hood vent. Um, I restored it, I kind of cleaned up the motor, oiled it, and it worked like new, so someone's happy with it. Regardless, here's the new one. Also stainless steel. Not as cool looking, but certainly very functional and above all quiet. And that led to replacing the original tile backsplash in the kitchen, which, again, this is one of those projects which we were doing for the sake of the next homeowners. I wouldn't have necessarily picked subway tiles for myself, but I think for the kitchen, for what we wound up designing, it did work. It wasn't what I would call contractor chic, like this boring shit that contractors do, for the cheapest possible dollar amount to achieve maximum profits when they go to screw over the next homeowners. The biggest struggle here was the grout that came pre-mixed with sand and it had the consistency of peanut butter. Then we replaced the linoleum that they had put on top of the linoleum. It, it was just too much trouble to remove the puke yellow from beneath because that would then necessitate us having to remove the linoleum with the plywood, together with the plywood, and then reapplying plywood. So n not interested in that, we just opted to rip up the top layer, clean it up, do weird stuff, I guess, <laughs> because we ran out of tile, I think, and just used stick-on tiles that, they did the job in terms of looks, in terms of utility. The final kitchen project involved painting the countertops, now this is again one of those projects where you have to keep using the kitchen somehow or you have to keep living somehow while you do this project. So just like the bathroom, suddenly our kitchen moved into the dining room and turned into a toaster oven full of 
Jimmy Dean's breakfast sausages. Ah, disgusting. However, surprisingly durable, this countertop. Even painted, it was very tough to scratch, very tough to damage. So, quite happy with the result. And of course it goes without saying, but I had to shell out another 400 bucks for a new countertop. I did manage to part out the old one and sell the circuit boards. So I had that going for me, which was nice. Last but not least, that puts us here into some final thoughts, tallies, and how much time and money it took to renovate this house. So, let's talk about the paint and the flooring. In the second part of the video, I talked about doing the floors, the wallpapers, repainting everything, putting in some hardwood floors. So, paint and supplies, $500. The finish, tool rental, the stain, about $400. And then the hardwood flooring and the tools, about $1,400. All in all, all put together, that took about 14 labor days. And when I say labor day, I'm going to estimate that realistically, we probably worked six hours. And since there were the two of us, it would be 14 times six, which is 84 times two, which is 168 hours. For electrical, we spent about $450 on outlets, lamps, cabling, LED bulbs, it's all in all, probably about eight to ten labor days. In the yard, since this was our first home, we had to buy all kinds of yard tools, such as lawn mower and chainsaw and shovels and all that kind of stuff. So that probably cost around eight hundred dollars. And then for all the projects that we then did with the stones and the spiral and pulling trees, planting stuff, so all of that stuff, about four hundred dollars. All in all, I think this is probably a place where we spent the most time and probably about 20 labor days and that's 20 labor days each for the deck and the door between the lumber and the doors we spent about seven hundred dollars and i think this took about five labor days to accomplish this one would have actually been less had i not been cheap but i decided to be cheap and i bought initially a sliding glass door from restore for about 50 bucks but it was in such bad shape and had such a hard time fitting it that I had to just shell out the 300 bucks and do the labor all over again. The ceiling fans were not too bad, relatively straightforward. $160 for the fans and two labor days, basically one labor day each, one for the living room and one for the bedroom. For the bathroom, there were a lot of components. Lumber, sinks, copper, countertop, ceiling fan, bathtub paint, light fixture, shower rod, tiles, grout, specialty tools and toilet, all of which ran about $1,200. As for labor, similar to the yard, it was just an ongoing project for a while until we had a big stretch of 10 days where we just finished the bathroom. But all in all, I would say the bathroom took 12 to maybe 14 labor days to finish. The kitchen was probably the most expensive in terms of cost because of, um, so we had to buy cabinet hardware, a wall oven, fridge, had to buy two cooktops, of course, range vent, countertop paint and supplies, linoleum tiles, faucet, microwave, um, tiles, grout, and adhesive. So all that ran about $2,000, although I think I got maybe four hundred dollars for the range vent and the old um wall oven so okay let's call that sixteen hundred dollars as for labor probably anywhere from 12 to 14 labor days and so before we launch into kind of final thoughts i didn't include everything so i did install a nest uh plugged a leak in the basement cut down a tree fought some bees partially as a direct result of the garden going a little bit out of control but all in all, everything you've seen in this video represents a majority of the work that we have done to this house in the last two years. I should also mention that every single project that you saw, I have a separate video on it that spells out how to do all these things in greater detail. I'll leave links to those in the description below. And with that, let's talk some final numbers. So, what does it all cost? Well. 
The supplies tally up to around $8,000. In labor, between myself and my wife, we probably spent about 900 hours over uh, the course of two years. We sold the house for 305 grand, uh, bought it for 249 grand, and if you subtract the supplies and the agent and real estate nonsense fees, that comes to about a profit of $36,000, not counting any amount of uh, mortgage that I paid off. And also not including the down payment I put towards the house. So a couple of observations. Number one, it was never our intent to flip the house. This wasn't an episode of HGTV where I sharpen pencils for a living and my wife hangs potatoes in the garage for a living and together our budget is three million dollars. Hell no, that's not realistic. That never happens. All we ever wanted to do was to buy a house and make it a nice place to live. That's it. I do believe that our skill set served us really well. And also here's another funny thing, like, would this house have appreciated on its own anyways over the course of two years without any of our help? Because considering what ha started happening almost two years ago now with this whole coronavirus business and as a result the real estate market going absolutely bananas, and so it's hard to say how much we can attribute this appreciation in price to just the market versus how much our effort affect the price. I, I don't really know the answer to that. But if nothing else, I like to believe that we breathed fresh life into this house and it deserved it. And now whoever's living in that house, I hope they are enjoying the fruits of our labor. And so that's about all I have for you today. If there's any one piece of advice I can give to any aspiring homeowners that is going to be this. As Dave Ramsey would say, trying to live in the same house that you're trying to renovate while working full time is going to suck the marrow right out of your bones. So pace yourselves and don't forget to enjoy the house that you are living in. So thank you for watching and I will see you next time.